group of numbers. We're a driver's license number. Go to the doctor's office, the dentist's office. What happens? You're sitting there, and three people come in after you do, and they get to go ahead of you. And you go up to the receptionist, and you say, I was here before they were. Why are they first? She says, did you take a number? So we're supposed to all take a number in life. So all of these causes cause us to have this low self-esteem. We just feel like we're nothing. We don't amount. Nobody even sees us. What's your number? Well, there are three solutions. And one of those is, I call it the go with change. The G stands for God. We're created in God's image. He promised us that we're created in His image. He stepped out into the space of, un of the universe and He said, He created man in His own image, Genesis tells us. And then He took a look at him and He said, I think I can do better, and then He created woman. Now that's just thrown in there for my husband especially. And then He says, the W is that we are winners. You can be you better than anyone else can be you. No one can be you as well as you can be you. And then the C, the change, is changing the way we talk to ourselves, our self-talk. You talking to you. Now here's a person who's changed her self-talk with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to meet her now. Her name is Patty Allen. She is a person that has the long-range goal. I thought she would be there now, but, you know, God changes our timing. We think we're going to do it one time, and He does it another time. Her name is Patty Allen. She was on her way to Aruba a few weeks ago, the last time we talked to her, but she's still here, and before she left, whatever her next thing, we're working together at the moment. Welcome, Patty Allen. I'm glad to be here. Now, Patty... We're going to jump back into some of the challenges of having this number one disease of the year 2000, and that's low self-image. Tell me a little bit about your early childhood and your family. I've already said you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Right. Tell me a little bit about your early family. Well, um, we were a rather well-to-do family, like you said, and um, we just had a lot of problems. I mean, my father, he was just, he was a fantastic person with a lot of personality, but he didn't do well in his situation. And my mother was an alcoholic, and um, one of the things that I remember that was so traumatizing as a child was that his theory must have been that I'm going to beat her until she decides she's never going to drink anymore. So as children, we would wake up and we would hear all this life and death stuff going on, you know, and, and she would say, kill me, kill me, I don't care, I'm not going to whatever and then we would hear all this so it was very frightening and um, uh, I was raised and in, in one of the things that was important in, in the low self-image was as a little child I was always fat I was so fat when I was born I was at two years old I couldn't walk and uh, they always called me patty pig and a lot of other things that were very negative they called me they called me stupid they always called me stupid and they and my father used to say you are so stupid, you better be good in bed because you're good for nothing else. And just, you know, those are very uh, tremendous to a child. And um, what kind of life were they living at that time? At that time, a very party life. I mean, life was, the only answer to life was have more fun so you don't think about problems. I mean, it was traveling to Florida and, and uh, a lot of travel and uh, just the party life. I mean, what do you mean when you mean, say party life? Well, they, of course, there was a lot of drinking. My daddy didn't drink, but he, what he ate, he made up for what, and what he drank. But he, he, um, they just, we just had a continual party. I mean, f Monday we got over the party and we worked towards getting to the next party f for the weekend. And we'd go down, we had a summer place and a yacht, and we yacht belonged to a yacht club. And so there was just this continually how to put on a front of being somebody big and fancy and and being and he was daddy was type he was a leader he was the captain of the power squad whatever he was he was always a captain he was the captain of the fire department whatever he did he did number one and mother just she was one of the old-fashioned very submissive wives just do whatever it takes to please your husband just do whatever you're playing you know don't speak up don't don't ever voice your opinion and so that was very negative to me and what were some of the things they were involved in? They were involved in, well, one of the things they were involved in, they were involved with uh, a lot of pornography and a lot of, uh, um, they'd have show 
pornographic movies, invite other families over, and there was wife swapping and just a lot of terrible sexual things. A lot of pornography laying around our house. All of us kids got involved in it, and it caused me to have terrible problems. And then he started molesting me, and that was terrible. And I lived in fear, you know, as a child. But at the same time, I loved God. I always just knew there was a God, and I loved God. And we were raised Catholics, and um, uh, I just believed everything. Anybody told me about God, I just believed it. But I didn't know him. I had no personal relationship. He was just someone far off somewhere who, if I was good enough, he would approve of me and answer my prayers someday. And that someday was way off in my concept of God. And so I was very, um, uh, I was a very sad little girl. I was very withdrawn. I hid, I mean, like my brother set the woods on fire behind our house. Mother called the fire department and they all went out to put out the fire and I was supposed to tell the fire department when, where to come and I hid in the closet. I mean, I, did, I couldn't even communicate with people. I mean, when I was six years old, mother took me to the store and gave me a dime and insisted I go in and buy something because I, I had never uh, talked to another adult, uh, you know, except, except when they talked to me, I'd say yes or no or whatever. And it was just so withdrawn. And that got worse and worse as I grew up, and worse in high school and because in high school, of course, more pressure is on you to be somebody. And I felt like nobody absolutely nobody and I in fact even in high school half the time I never went to school I'd go into the woods and I'd hide and pretend I went to school and I'd come home and I, I broke out with all kinds of sores and things from nerves and feeling so bad and yet then we had this life where we acted like we were just somebody at certain times and of course I never did much talking I was very very shy very strong and very it felt inadequate in in my I had three brothers two one two brothers and one sister and just felt like they were wonderful and I was stupid which but I know they suffered terribly and felt a lot of that too now as an adult looking back but um, I just didn't fit you know and I hated the lifestyle we were in and um, it just it just it was just all everything was unhappy I mean, the, the perversion, and there was a lot of money, but the money just bought more stuff that I didn't like, more partying and more, I mean, it was just always partying. I mean, we had, a, we had built this huge stage. We had this big band, and we danced and danced and danced and drank and danced, and I mean, I remember that going on for about a year, and I mean, such silly things happened. It's like somebody left their baby, and they were so drunk they didn't even remember they left their baby for two days, and we didn't know whose baby it was. I mean, how weird people can get. You know, and I, all of that, all I ever saw was, this is weird, I don't like it. I want out, I want away from it, I don't want to be a part. I want out, but I didn't know how to get out. And, and then another strange thing that happened, just some of the little statements that are made, you talk about words that people say that just devastate you. And it happens to all of us, but one of the things that happened to me was when I was 15, and I was very, very immature, so I was like 10 or something, 12. My brother was getting married, and uh, they said, what kind, we had a big family party, and they said, what kind of contraceptive are you going to use? And I said, oh, you can't use contraceptives. The Catholic Church says you'll go to hell. And they, all of these relatives started laughing, and they said, you don't really believe the stuff the church tells you, do you? That kind of stuff, that's just, that's just put on. I mean, we just, we just go there and we just act that way, but they don't really do that. I mean, it's not like what they say, and they said all these gross negatives, you know. I mean, they said all the priests sleep with the nuns, and they have babies and kill them, and I mean, oh, they said all this, and it just, just, I just, because I had held the church up, you know, because I went to parochial school, and it was like, at home, it was horrible, but at, at school and at church, I believed that and it wasn't really that way, but I believed that everything was pure and wonderful, and I, and I wanted so to be the things they would say. And, and I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be somebody that God was pleased with. You know, and one of the things they used to say, they used to say, raise your hand if you want to be martyred. And I used to feel so terrible. It seemed like they said that every day. And I didn't want to be martyred, so I wouldn't raise my hand. And I thought it was such a terrible, quote, Christian. I thought I was a Christian. And all these strange things that, that I just thought, see, you're no good. You don't want to be martyred. And I thought, well, I don't want to lie either, so <laughs> I'm going to raise my hand. <laughs> and and I, so I wouldn't do it. And just these strange situations that happen. 
how did you get out of that situation? Your parents died, and your brother died. Well, they didn't died. die till a long time later. Uh, so my answer was, you know, I was looking for change. You know, something's got to be better than this. And a child's concept was the style, the life that we came from is not good. Therefore, I looked to the reverse of that. I thought poverty must be the answer. So my concept was I will go away in the somewhere, you know, out back in Alaska or Australia where my was my vision and go live out by myself or out in the tulies with the animals and the trees and everything will be wonderful because they don't have any problems because they don't have any money so they can't have all these things that they do that take money to do them so it must be good so I mean I didn't that was not in my conscious mind but it was in the back and so I aimed towards that and the circumstances came about and I got to go to Alaska and and in Alaska um, Two I enjoyed that for a while. Two rooms and a path. Right. Two rooms and a path and just the whole big exciting adventure, you know, and of poverty. <laughs> of poverty. Because I prayed for poverty when I, well, that was later when I became a Christian, but, um, but I really was, pr I mean, see, I prayed all my life. I prayed, oh, I prayed by the hour. I'd spend hours on my knees and pray as a child. But I was always begging God, and I was always hoping, God, oh, oh, someday when I'll pray enough and be good enough, then you'll answer my prayer. So I had no faith to believe that anything would ever happen. It's just that I knew this is what you were supposed to do, and someday maybe you'd be a saint, and maybe God would answer your prayers or something. I mean, it was all confusion. So living out in Alaska, and, and then I got married and, and had a baby, and I thought, I thought, well, I've lived both extremes. And so I, one day I just started crying. I thought, there's something terrible missing in my life. You know, it's not money, and it's not adventure, and it's not having a, a nice husband and a baby, because I thought, well, that must be, because I was afraid of having a husband and a baby because of what I saw in my family. But I finally conceded one day, okay, well, we're gonna do the thing that the world says, you know, uh, Mr. Prince Charming and you live happily ever after. Well, he was my idea of Prince Charming. He was, he was delightful. And he was a big, uh, big outdoors tough guy. And I thought he was great. He looked like Clark Gable. I mean, what else do you want? And <laughs> so, but then one day I came to that conclusion. So I started crying. And, and right after that, someone came to see me who knew about the Lord. And I've told that before, so I'm going to tell all that. But I accepted Jesus. And then my life, then I began to see you know, that I was accepted by God, and, and I knew that I was going to heaven, and I knew it was his child, but I still didn't have any of my thinking right because of these long, the past being all messed up. How did you get your thinking right? Well, of course, reading the Word, and being taught the Word, studying the Word, and praying, but one thing that was wrong in my life, I mean, good things, a lot of good things happen instantly. I mean, a lot of good things, wonderful things. Um, wonderful things happened instantly? Well, I began to have a lot of joy, and my husband could see it. My son got healed. Uh, my daughter got healed of being deaf. Just a lot of things happened that were very good. And 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 I love the Lord, and um, I'm not discred discrediting that time in my life, because it was good. Uh, God moved us out. We were started in a very solid church, and he moved us out in a little community where there was nothing. And the Lord really, really, because I was hungry for God. I mean, I just went anywhere where there was more about God. And I believe that. I mean, anybody, if, if I meet somebody and I thought, man, they're full of God, I'd just follow right behind them, you know, and learn from them what I could learn. And, uh, and I believe that's real important, you know, to have a hunger. Because I believe that God looks at our heart and that that's, and not so much the mistakes we make, because I made a lot of mistakes, and I and I learned a lot of things wrong about the Lord. But He's such a loving, kind God that He just looks with His heart, and He doesn't do like we do. You haven't got your doctrine straight, you know. He just He looks at us, at our real heart, and so um, God used me in in starting a church in Valdez, Alaska, where the oil pipe, the oil spill was. And then we started a Christian school, and and just uh, some wonderful things we went happened. Went to Israel. Oh yeah, and then some of my goals that I wanted all my life, 
yeah, I got to go to Israel. Now, this is further down the line. But I got to go to Israel, got to go to Bible school, got to go to Norval Hayes' Bible school, and um, uh, I got to go on a mission trip to Mexico. That was this year, and have another one lined up for Aruba. And so the, the desire, see, have come, and one of the keys that I found was keep seeking God. Just keep seeking God. You know, and, and, and going to church. I always went to church because even when our church, I mean, I went to the best church I could find. I mean, I'm sure everybody does that, but there was just an importance by keep doing, keep seeking God. And, and I knew down inside, I really knew that even though I had things messed up um, from my past and had doctrinal things messed up, that if you just seek God, God is honest, God is loving, and God is going to bring you, you know, to the next truth, to the next truth, and, and that he, I know he's always trying to show us things, but sometimes we don't hear, but he's going to just be, he's patient. I learned he's very patient with me, and I began to be patient with myself and say, it's okay, you know, I don't have to be overnight some, you know, and, and I'm a different person than anybody, you know, I, 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 I'm praying that sometime God will get me to go back to Alaska, and because of what I can share and the change that they see. You know, I am a different person. I was very mousy. I mean, oh, oh, I was really mousy. <laughs> I cannot believe this <laughs> oh, picture of you. I mean, bad. You're very mousy. assertive now and real I comfortable even with people. Oh, I love people. And you're setting up the seminars now and, and just doing wonderful and talk to all kinds of people. I know, and see, that's a miracle. See, because I couldn't do that in myself. And, and the Lord showed me, I'm working with Bonnie, and, and, um, and I'm just so happy because it's in an area where I never could do it, and I'm, I'm comprehending that that's the grace of God. And I kept remembering how God sent Paul to the, because he was a, so educated and astute, to the, to the Gentiles, and he sent Peter to the, to the religious people who, and Peter was just a plain fisherman, so I can relate to Peter, because I was a plain person. I mean, plain, I look at some of those pictures, and I, and I was a plain Jane, no communicative person. And then now, is God's just opening the world, and it's just so, I'm so happy. You really about. radiate joy. I'm you're Philippians. Just You're just <laughs> every word in Philippians talking about joy. I tell you, I had said rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That's you, <laughs> and you do, and you and you give that out. So in the last moment, how would you help another person who's gone through unbelievable things and some we didn't get to? And if you'd ever yes. like her to speak there, yes. we'll a lot of truck things. over there. <laughs> we'll be glad to. And you can have this videotape by contacting 4618148 and get it for yourself. But in the last moment, what would you say could help someone to go from mousy to assertive and enjoying doing seminars. The, the seeking God and therefore knowing that he's going to bring that knowledge to you of who you are. When I realize who I am in God, that I am somebody. I mean, I am somebody. Created God God's made image. me like this. And he thinks it's cool. And I'm beginning to think it's super cool. <laughs> and I didn't used to. And now so to know that. So shouldn't be a person in the year 2000 <laughs> with a low self-image. And I'm happy about yes. that. Because you're creating God's image. And she, she found out that she can truly be, Patty Allen can be mm -hmm. Patty Allen better than any other person can be Patty Allen, and so can you be you better than anyone else can be you. I have a wonderful person in the, in the studio. Hello, Tony. Happy to see you. I'm Bonnie Libhart along with Patty Allen, and I hope you've enjoyed this version of how to overcome the number one disease for the year 2000. That's a low self-image. Bring it up to being God's image of you. Bless your heart for watching.